I'm Nima Rajan. Federal cabinet ministers are warning Canadians that COVID-19 travel rules and border rules may change. This comes as researchers learn more about the new Omicron variant of COVID-19. Transport Minister Omar Al-Gabra says the federal government is in talks with the provinces about extending its new COVID-19 testing requirement for arriving air travelers to include passengers arriving from the United States. An eight-year-old London, Ontario girl has died. This was after a vehicle hit several pedestrians and at least one other vehicle last evening. The group included some children as young as six. Last night, police said several pedestrians were taken to hospital. The driver, a 76-year-old woman, was not among those taken to hospital and no arrests have been made. Quebec's public security minister has ordered the police ethics commissioner to investigate Quebec City police over another video of a violent arrest. That's on top of an internal probe into Friday evening's arrest of a white man outside of a restaurant in the city's Safwa district. That incident came just hours before a violent arrest captured on video that shows officers hitting, dragging, and pinning at least two black people to the ground. Five officers are involved in that arrest have been suspended with pay. British Columbia is still holding its breath as it reluctantly hosts a two-day visit by yet another atmospheric river of rain. It is the third such system that has hit the province in recent weeks. More than two dozen weather alerts and travel advisories have been issued for much of the southern and coastal BC regions. Parliamentary Budget Officer Yves Giroux says the government has set aside enough money to build water and wastewater systems in First Nations communities over the next five years. But he estimates another $138 million per year will be needed to help First Nations operate these systems. Mr. Giroux warns the longer it takes for the Liberals to fulfill a 2015 election promise to end all boil water advisories in First Nations, the higher the cost. The government is asking the National Advisory Committee on Immunization for fresh guidance regarding vaccines. This is about bringing in new standards for COVID-19 vaccine booster doses in the face of the new Omicron variant. This comes as Ottawa is now requiring almost all air travelers entering Canada to be tested for COVID-19 upon arrival at the airport and isolate until they get their results. For now, the rules don't apply to travelers flying in from the United States. All of the Canadian Omicron cases confirmed so far have been from Nigeria. Opposition leader Aaron O'Toole will again allow his Conservative caucus to have a free vote on a government bill seeking to ban conversion therapy. The practice is widely discredited as harmful with its aim to change an individual's sexual orientation or gender identity. Earlier in the week, the Liberals introduced legislation for a third time in the House of Commons to criminalize the practice, and it is expected to come up to a vote soon. David Cohen has been sworn in as the new United States ambassador to Canada. He is the first full-time American envoy since 2019. Mr. Cohen, a lawyer, lobbyist and fundraiser, served as a senior advisor and chief diversity officer at U.S. communications giant Comcast. He is the first appointee to take over the role on a full-time basis since Donald Trump's choice, Kelly Kraft. She decamped in August 2019 to serve as ambassador to the United Nations. The commander of the North American Aerospace Defense Command is warning that China and Russia are developing new ways to attack the continent. This comes as NORAD awaits political direction to modernize the outdated early warning system. U.S. General Glenn Van Herc made the comment yesterday during his first visit to Ottawa since heading up the Joint American-Canadian Command. There is concern over reports of a nuclear-capable hypersonic missile test by China in August. Such weapons are difficult to detect and intercept in a timely manner. Canada's new immigration minister says the federal government is committed to finding long-term solutions to the Central American migration crisis that has forced millions from their homes. The ripples of Venezuela's refugee crisis are expected to displace 6 million people by year's end. Sean Fraser says Canada's approach to finding lasting solutions would be focused on leveraging its feminist foreign policy. The policy targets help towards women and girls as a way of elevating the economic circumstances of those around them. 
And the fall fishing season for lobster opened early this morning in the two most lucrative lobster fishing areas in Canada. The annual event off southwestern Nova Scotia is known as Dumping Day. Hundreds of boats set sail for the lobster fishing areas known as LFA 33 and LFA 34, which extend from Halifax to Digby. We'll be right back, everyone. In a rare public speech, Richard Moore, the head of the UK's Foreign Intelligence Service, says China is MI6's single greatest priority, along with Russia and Iran. And he's not alone. The commander of NORAD is warning that China, along with Russia, are developing new methods of attack. But Beijing also has other ways in which it is seeking to shape the world. These efforts are not only limited to national governments, but also target the sub-national level along with public and private sectors. A recent report from the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies takes a deeper look at the influence efforts by the Chinese Communist Party in its publication titled All Over the Map. And with us to unpack this is one of the authors of the publication, Mr. Nathan Pekarzik, senior fellow at the FDD. Sir, welcome to Forum Daily. Thank you for having me. So firstly, uh, can you give our viewers an overview of how the CCP is seeking to extend its influence around the world? party pursues a united front that combines private sector influence as well as engagement with state, local, provincial level authorities to curry influence, to seize positions of authority and information, access to information, um, and then to um, seize and deploy that influence um, through legislative means, through private sector and commercial means. And ultimately, we've been seeing this play out um, across the world in the way that um, domestic authorities and powers end up lobbying on behalf of Beijing. All right, sir. Well, moving to your report um, all over the map, uh, what would you say are the major takeaways from it? I think there needs to be an increased awareness among democratic, um, particularly federally organized republics across the world to this type of threat. Um, there needs to be protection against the way that Chinese money, private sector influence, and government-backed actors can take control of political discourse, political action, as well as supply chains and technology flows. And we know this report also touched on influence efforts at the sub-national level. So tell us a little bit more about uh, sub-national levels and how uh, these influence efforts are uh, impacting them. So when we look at authorities below the federal or national level, oftentimes elected officials and bureaucrats are optimizing for economic growth, for jobs, for inbound investment. China recognizes this, and they use these lower level authorities, subnational, provincial, state, local, to get around concerns that might exist at national levels about national security threats, whether that's in terms of investing into critical infrastructure or buying real estate near military positions, um, as well as in putting pressure on federal authorities, national level authorities, um, to not take a hard line against China's interests, whether that's in recognizing human rights abuses in China, or whether that's protecting the commercial influence that Chinese companies and government players may have accrued. And you mentioned that uh, these uh, negotiations are providing economic benefits at the subnational level. So are all of these influence attempts negative or are there some positive aspects of it? Typically, those positive aspects show up in short term time horizon. So you may have increased levels of investment at a local level. You may have short term job boons. But over the longer term, we see that um, these influence measures mean um, that long-term benefits accrue to the Chinese Communist Party and to Beijing, not to local economies. Look to the solar industry as one example where 10 years ago, Western players in the United States were dominant sources of technology and innovation, um, received investment that led to short-term boons, but over the past decade have wound up in a position where China dominates the overwhelming majority of this industry, have offshore jobs, have taken over supply chains. Um, so the, those benefits seem to only accrue in, in the short term. The long-term strategic positioning that, that China um, seizes turns out to be just for Beijing's benefit, not for anyone else's. 
All right, sir, just uh, under a minute left here, but many of our viewers are aware of the Belt and Road Initiative, but what are some other ways that the Chinese government is expanding its influence in the U.S. and Canada in particular? So um, direct investment, so buying technology, buying critical infrastructure, um, influencing data protocols, cross-border data flows, access to data that technology champions in the West may have access to, um, and then convening fora where elected officials from Canada or from the United States participate and go back to their home districts, their, their home provinces, and reiterate Chinese Communist Party talking points. Um, this sort of softer method is something that um, I think that we shouldn't um, discount. I think that the shifting narrative, the use of Chinese Communist Party talking points is um, really a subversive measure that we see playing out over the long term and clearly directed mm -hmm. by the Chinese Communist Party's um, mm -hmm. ambitions here. In light of the ongoing pandemic, officials are highlighting the importance of World AIDS Day today. A statement released today by the Prime Minister says this year's theme for World AIDS Day is titled And Inequalities and AIDS and Pandemics. He says this underscores the urgency of putting an end to economic, social, cultural and legal inequalities. And these inequalities have resulted in the prolonging of the HIV and AIDS epidemic. South of the border, Dr. Anthony Fauci, the top U.S. infectious disease expert, says the COVID-19 pandemic has diverted scientific and financial resources from the fight against AIDS, which is seriously impeding global efforts to achieve the UN's goal of ending AIDS by 2030. Well, with us to unpack this further is Mr. Gary Lacasse, Executive Director of the Canadian AIDS Society. Sir, welcome to Forum Daily. Thank you very much. Now, according to 2018 figures, uh, there are over 62,000 people living with HIV in Canada. Uh, but what are the most recent numbers so far, sir? It's over, it's more like over 70,000 because PHAC has not increased the number since 2016. Oh, so, and having 2,000 and more infections per year, when you have the data, it, it comes out to more than 70,000. All right, sir. Well, before moving any further, I think we should clarify the difference between HIV and AIDS itself. Yeah. Well, HIV is when you are, when you have the infection. AIDS is what's developed from the infection if you're not in treatment. And that leads to death. So uh, HIV is considered a chronic illness now, but it's an incurable chronic illness. It's the only incurable illness in uh, all the sexually transmitted and blood-borne infections. And we know uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, he spoke on how the pandemic is diverting uh, scientific and financial resources away from the fight against AIDS. So tell us a little bit more about this. How has the pandemic impacted research efforts? Research efforts have continued because the funding was already engaged. What has stopped or has almost completely stopped is the testing. So getting people tested and into care and treatment has come to a, uh, to a halt, mostly across Canada, everywhere. So we are seeing, for the first time, uh, incredible numbers of transmissions from mother to infant at birth that we haven't seen in decades. So we're really lagging behind, and uh, it's going to take a few years to re-engage all these people that are not getting sexual health testing done. And at the same time, we also have the issue of stigma or discrimination against the AIDS community. So uh, what is the current environment when it comes to this issue in Canada and what needs to be done to tackle it, sir? Well, we know now that, uh, and we've known for a few years, that if you take effective treatment daily, that you cannot transmit HIV anymore So sexually. So that means that you, we are at the cusp of maybe getting to zero transmissions if there is enough funding that's put towards getting there, as Dr. Fauci said, the investment has to be ramped up for us to really have an effective front against it. So that's news in itself. And also we have PrEP that ensures that somebody who's HIV negative cannot uh, acquire HIV uh, from a, in an infection from somebody who has HIV who's not on effective treatment. So there's a lot of tools in our toolbox but we have to be uh, more 
multi-level approach to how we do prevention and how we do care and support for people living in Canada. And that's where we're lagging behind in Canada is care and support of the people living with HIV. All right, sir, just about a minute left here, but uh, the PM mentioned in his statement that those affected by HIV and AIDS are often facing economic, social, cultural, and legal inequalities. So uh, let's touch on these issues here in Canada. Well, that's the issue that we have, is that we're in a federation. So the province and territories are in charge of their own uh, health uh, departments across the country. So uh, there's... As we've said since the beginning of the epidemic, it's the social determinants of health that drive new infections up. So, and it's also not talking about HIV. So we need education. We need better social determinants of health, be it housing, food security, and uh, harm reduction services for those who use injection drugs. And uh, I think we can win this, but it will not be under this prime minister who has not increased our funding since 2008. So uh, we need to have a uh, government that really engages in us, with us in the community, because the community makes the difference. And the uh, AIDS understands that mm -hmm. and has been trying to get governments on board. Nigeria announced today that it has detected its first case of the Omicron coronavirus variant. The Nigeria Center for Disease Control identified a case of the variant in November, not October. This as well as two cases among people who arrived from South Africa last week. The news comes a day after Canada added Nigeria, Egypt and Malawi to its list of seven African countries from which, which it would not accept travelers for now. Russian President Vladimir Putin wants the U.S. and its allies to guarantee that NATO forces won't move further east and deploy weapons near Russia's borders. Mr. Putin made the statement during a ceremony at the Kremlin involving foreign ambassadors. Tensions have been soaring in recent weeks about a Russian troop buildup near Ukraine. It has worried Ukrainian and Western officials who see it as a possible sign of Moscow's intention to invade its ex-Soviet neighbor. NATO foreign ministers are debating a report on the lessons to learn from the military organization's 18-year presence in the conflict-ravaged Afghanistan region. Ahead of Wednesday's meeting, NATO Secretary Jens Stoltenberg suggested that the security operation become a victim of mission creep. He says, quote, we must recognize that over the years, the international community set a level of ambition that went well beyond the original aim of fighting terrorism. China is lashing out at Shinzo Abe after the former Japanese prime minister warned of serious security and economic consequences of any Chinese military action against self-ruled Taiwan. The Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson said Mr. Abe had talked nonsense, pointed fingers at Taiwan issues, and made irresponsible remarks on China's internal affairs. He said China protested to Japan through diplomatic channels. China claims self-governing Taiwan as its own territory to be annexed by force if necessary. And it has been upping its military threat to the island. Meanwhile, China's state council has issued an order saying 85% of its citizens will use the national language of Mandarin by 2025. The policy aims to make Mandarin virtually universal by 2035. This is including in rural areas and among ethnic minorities. It says the use of Mandarin is inadequate and needs to be improved to meet the demands of the modern economy. The UN's World Migration Report 2022 reveals that the pandemic has radically altered mobility around the world. It continued, or rather it counted, about 281 million international migrants. This is not the 283 million as initially expected. This amounts to just 3.6% of the global population. The International Organization for Migration projects the growth in the number of international migrants is likely to remain weaker as long as travel and other restrictions remain. It says the pandemic also seems to have accelerated the hostile rhetoric toward migrants that has been growing in the last decade. U.S. President Joe Biden offered his condolences to the families of eight people wounded in yesterday's attack at a Michigan high school in which three students were killed. 
Oakland County Under Sheriff Mike McCabe has identified the dead as a 16-year-old boy and two girls, ages 14 and 17. Mr. McCabe says deputies took the shooting suspect, a 15-year-old sophomore, into custody without incident. Three people were injured, one seriously, when a 250-kilogram Second World War bomb exploded at a construction site next to a busy railway line in Munich, Germany. A column of smoke was seen rising from the site near the approach to Munich Central Station. Unexploded bombs are still found frequently in Germany, this especially during construction work, but sites in central Munich are usually scanned carefully. British officials say about 30,000 people in the north of England and in Scotland have been without electricity for the better part of a week after a major storm. Storm Arwen disrupted transportation and caused residential power outages starting Friday. Officials have said three people died in storm-related incidents. UK Business Secretary Kwasi Kwarteng told Parliament that while about 95% of those affected have had their power restored, some 30,000 remained without electricity as of Wednesday. The Energy Networks Association says some households would not get their power back before the end of the week. Now this is love. An Indian man has built a replica one-third the size of the historic Taj Mahal for his wife. But unlike the original, it is their residence and not a mausoleum. Constructed with white marble and imitation in the imitation in Buranpur includes the large dome of the real monument in Agra. All right, that'll do it for your look at national and international news for today. I'm Nima Rajan and this was Forum Daily News.